and he saw that his life was like all other lives. It had the same function, and it differed from them only in shape, as one salt cellar is different from another, or one knife blade. What happened to him had happened before, and it would happen again more than once. Probably someone would lie awake all night in that very same hospital, feeling his lungs contract and expand, contract and expand, until the whole of him was limited to the one effort of breathing for somebody else. But it would not be Elizabeth who was dying of pneumonia two rooms down the hall. So that, that part of um, what happened to him had happened before, and it would happen again more than once, really hit home. William Maxwell's 1937 novella, They Came Like Swallows, depicts an ordinary family in the American Midwest, ravaged by the influenza epidemic of 1918. But while it recounts tragedy from over a century ago, it still speaks to us profoundly today, as if mourning the death of a loved one not a hundred years ago, but a month, a week, or even a day ago. Because across eras, across the globe, across cultures, our experiences find echoes in each other's narratives, especially in times of collective struggle. Welcome to Social Distances, a podcast where we examine the distances that both separate us and bring us together during the complex and compounded crises of 2020 and beyond. I'm your host, Logan, and today we're talking to Dr. Ann Sikulski, Professor of Comparative Literature at Ohio Wesleyan University, about the ways literature has bridged gaps in time and space during the pandemic, connecting us to our past and to each other in ways we once imagined to be impossible. Anne's story begins on a porch swing in the backyard of her home in the quaint college town of Delaware, Ohio. But little did she know, this small Ohio town would be the landscape through which she would experience once-in-a-lifetime global events, and subsequently connect to the world more intimately than ever, even as her physical surroundings became more isolated. This year I was planning to actually travel. I, I had a grant to go to Japan to do research in a library there on a project I'm doing on the Tokyo trials. I was also thinking of going to Bialystok, Poland to uh, do some research on my family history in my last name. Um, so I had big international travel plans and none of that happened. So. Uh, the most traveling I did was walking out of my house, the back door to my house. <laughs> and so basically my dog and I, every day, we would walk out the back door of my house across my yard to the back of the yard. And I'd sit in the swing with him there and I would start reading. And, and I used reading as a means to travel. Everything I read during the summer transported me elsewhere. Uh, you know, I, I read travel memoirs. I re read... Uh, a, uh, you know, since I couldn't travel, I read about other people's travels to the Middle East, Asia, Europe. Many of the books she turned to had to do with the last great pandemic of 1918. One of those was Yes, They Came Like Swallows, which transported her right back to the Midwest. But the Midwest of a century ago, battling not COVID, but influenza. William Maxwell's book, They Came Like Swallows, really spoke to me because it's set here in the Midwest. And the way he describes the town in the novel um, it, it so resonates with what Delaware, Ohio looks like. But her travels also took her back across the American West in Catherine Porter's 1939 novel, Pale Horse, Pale Rider, and even across the globe in the diary of a Japanese doctor. You mentioned pandemic literature, which I don't know if prior to 2020, we really considered that as a primary uh, subsection of the study of literature or not, but certainly it seems as relevant as ever. Uh, and I know, of course, as you mentioned, there have been historical works that were influenced by the 1918 flu pandemic. Certainly, I imagine that after 2020, after this crisis and years to come, there will be literature birthed from this crisis as well. You know, what are some of the the characteristics of quote-unquote pandemic literature and what does that mean 
uh, you know, f- moving forward? They came like swallows. This is based on William Maxwell's uh, life. Um, uh, his mother, they, his family did get the Spanish flu and his mother actually died from it. So this is very much a work about a young boy who loses his mother the way William Maxwell did. So, um, and, and then Catherine M. Porter's Pale Horse, Pale Rider is very much a, a, a short story about her going through, she did have the Spanish flu and almost died from it. And so she really writes from personal experience. Um, the Japanese diary I look at, it's a doctor who's recording how this flu you know, comes to this small mountain village and spreads and no one understands what it is and no one understands how to cure it. What was fascinating in all three, the, the diary, the Japanese diary, they came like swallows in Catherine Ann Porter's Pale Horse, Pale Rider, is initially uh, the this there's an uncertainty, an unknown factor, just like all of us were doing. You know, when I think about where I was in February, I was traveling I was in DC, I was in crowded restaurants, I was in the airport, I was in, you know, a conference. I met my cousin who had been at a conference with hundreds of people. I, you know, and the, the, the COVID-19 was already in the United States. Um, it was probably in DC as we were walking around naively thinking we were okay. Um, and the same thing occurs in these three stories, whether it's the Japanese medical diary or the two works of fiction, there's this unknown, and it seems like it's distant, it's far away, and they came like swallows, they refer to it as the Spanish flu, right, and what did we call COVID-19 initially, Uh, you know, the Wuhan flu or the Chinese flu, you know, it was, it was marked as foreign and elsewhere, and I can still remember, uh, you know, during the summer at one point talking to my neighbor and she said to me, she said, I never thought it was going to get to us. And we talk about the flu like it's an enemy, uh, like a, like we're at war, we're at war with this unseen enemy. And very much that's the language in these works of fiction and the diary. And What I also notice is there's a lot of emphasis on the moment it invades the home, the moment it invades uh, one's personal space. So-called pandemic literature also gives us insight into what the end might look like, or at least how we might feel coming out of so much tragedy. The next stage in all these works that we're, we unfortunately are not there yet is all of these works have endings. <laughs> we do not have an ending to our story yet. Um, we're still in it. And so uh, the ending of uh, They Came Like Swallows is uh, it's told through the points of view of uh, the, two, the two sons and then the father, the husband. And, and it really deals with survivor's guilt. And Catherine Ann Porter's Pale Horse, Pale Rider also deals with survivor guilt. And again, as I said, I'm very lucky. I, I, no one in my immediate circle has had it or died from it, but we know, you know, hundreds of thousands of people have died from it, right, um, in this country. So there are people who are dealing with survivor's guilt right now. And um, there are people whose lives have been utterly uh, destroyed or transformed from this experience. And this work in particular, the one that's about the Midwest, it, it, it ends with coming to grips with having lost someone. The guilt the characters feel for maybe that they had brought. The youngest son feels guilty that he is responsible for his mother's death because he brought... <clears throat> He, he entered the room when he shouldn't have, and um, and he might have been contaminated. And so those kind of emotions are emotions that many people now are, are going through with COVID-19. Um, so, yeah. So that, so the literature that I talked about, there was a pattern of sort of from the unknown foreign and it creeps and it's an enemy and it creeps closer and closer, enters your personal space, your home, 
absolutely destroys it, changes it, but somehow you survive. And you survive, but it's not the same. And and I'm I'm very curious to see what our our stories of survival are going to be like. Some scholars say that Western literature began with the plague. And perhaps there's another new beginning in store for literature post-COVID. We don't have the luxury of hindsight yet to write about it. Uh, I look forward to that day <laughs> when right. we do, when we can get out of this and uh, go, boy, that was really bad. Now let me write about it. But through her work with students at Ohio Wesleyan, Anne also realized just how much the way we write about it is changing. You know, we're all being ushered into, uh, you know, the digital era if we haven't been already. But of course, 2020 in some ways, you know, kicked us in the butt a little bit to give us a, a gentle, maybe not so gentle shove into the digital era. Yeah, I mean, it's very interesting because I'm definitely one of the people who is not embracing digital at anything. <laughs> and in the same way that the pandemic made Anne's porch swing both an airplane and a time machine, the digital shift influenced our access and attention to more diverse literature. Anne's seen that in her virtual classes already. We had a prime example of the importance of the digital world. So many of the works I want to assign are very hard to actually assign because they're inaccessible. Either they're not an English translation. I mean, if they're not an English translation, I can't teach them unless students have a very advanced reading knowledge of Japanese. And and so I have to find works that are available in English translation. So that's an accessibility issue. And there was discussion of this very famous Japanese woman writer, Yoshia Nobuko, and I have her work in Japanese, and I was Googling to see, you know, I've read it in Japanese ages ago. Has anyone translated anything of her, you know, is it accessible in English yet? And, and that's the other thing with translation. Often when the work was written and when it gets translated can be uh, decades. Well, it turned out it had been translated by my, my uh, colleague, Sarah Frederick, but not in your traditional format. Sarah Frederick translated it and was able to get it published through Amazon and Kindle version. So my students could get it and it wasn't expensive. And for whatever reason, of all the stories I taught, actually my students liked many of the stories I taught in that class, but this one just, several students, I would say maybe there were about 15 students in the class and maybe a third of the students really, they wrote about it in discussion board posts. They wrote about it. I think I'm going to say three students actually did their final papers on this story and this writer. Something about this story and this writer's life um, really resonated with my students here in Ohio in 2020. Well, yeah, it was fall semester, so 2020. Um, and this work was written in the early 1900s on the other side of the globe. So this is a way in which the, the digital media is revolutionizing these traditional institutions of dissemination. Actually, Anne and others in her department have been working to make the study of literature much more global and diverse. And the pandemic just opened the door that much more quickly by forcing flexibility and innovation in the way we read. My department, um, for several years now, we've been kind of thinking about uh, broadening uh, student interest in literature because um, we're, we're noticing what people read how people read is changing. But we really started uh, working with students to think about what it means to read and what it means to, um, what a text means, that it doesn't have to be, you know, uh, words on paper, you know, bound in paperback or hardcover. Text stories, what our department really is, is about storytelling and um, getting the stories of voices that are normally not, not heard, heard. 
Um, we're a comparative lit department, so we're very interested in getting stories of voices from other parts of the world uh, heard by our students. And, and for them to listen, they have to care. So then we need to teach this, these stories in a way where students find them relevant. And thus, the so-called digital humanities are also empowering voices by breaking down traditional barriers, expanding readership, and getting more diverse interpretations of texts as well. So, you know, Roland Barth is famous for saying the death of the author, that the author doesn't write the work, it's the reader who writes the work, because the way the reader reads is the story. Uh, and you and I, we could read the same story, and we'll walk away with completely different you know, understanding of the story or experience. And so we've actually been taking that theory to practice with digital humanities, getting our students to become more interactive with the reading and, uh, you know, getting what they write, their assignments disseminated, not just between. So the traditional learning experience is the student writes a paper and the professor reads it, grades it, and that's it. It's a very private conversation. This is this is where the digital can be useful. Um, and so right now we're working on a, a digital book of the course where the students' writings will be part of this course, interacting with what they read and how what they read resonated with them. And then it'll serve as an archive. So this takes archive to a new meaning, not dusty letters of historic importance by you know a prime minister or a president or whatnot, but uh, the voices of our students going through a pandemic, going through a summer of riots, um, and having those stories archived because what we have gone through is historic and people will be reading it in the future. And um, our department is really a department where we're trying to get the voices of all people heard, not just those who um, are in positions of power and can therefore be heard, but, you know, get the, the marginalized voice heard. Because at the end of the day, the story of the COVID-19 pandemic is not one giant, monolithically experienced tragedy. It's a story made up of many individual stories that, when woven together, can perhaps give future generations a narrative more true and perhaps even more moving. And as Anne said in a lecture all the way back in the summer of 2020, each one is valuable. So um, at the beginning of my talk, I uh, talked about the act of reading, but now I would like to talk about writing. What stories can all of us tell? We all have stories to tell about this historic event. For us not to be erased, rendered invisible by being part of some statistical number, we need to have our voices heard as individuals going through this experience. I'm your host, Logan, and this is Social Distances, where each week we look at a different cross-section of society that has been impacted by the crisis and unpack topics ranging from the environment, earth and death, shelter, media, race relations, and more through insights from historians, anthropologists, policymakers, and other researchers. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And check out the video edition on social media under at MidStory or at www.midstory.org. This program is made possible in part by Ohio Humanities, a state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Social Distances is produced by MidStory, edited by Samuel Chang, written by Ruth Chang and Logan Sander, with original music by Dream Louder and graphics by Jesse Walton.